Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming uh, to the Stephen Lawrence Gallery to see this exhibition about men and, uh, and to hear the artist talk related to the exhibition. My name is David Waterworth. I'm the curator of the gallery, and we are really excited to have Seema uh, come and uh, curate this, this particular exhibition. It, I mean, I, I'm sure you'll agree it, it's um, turned out amazingly the way all the separate works, all the separate um, exhibits work together um, really functions very well and makes for a very exciting overall all the exhibition. What we're going to do uh, first of all is I'm going to ask each artist to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their practice and then we're going to then follow up with looking at each uh, exhibit in detail and ask them to talk about this particular body of work that they're showing here in more detail. So I, when I was invited to do the show here, um, I knew that I wanted to show my work Lost in the Soot, which um, focuses on memory and loss. Um, and as, as a result of that, I started questioning how else memory and loss can be photographed through um, our practices. Um, which led me to, um, which led me to think about the artists um, and the particular type of work that I wanted to be showing. I also wanted the, I, I wanted to attract a, a diverse audience. I wanted the audience that come in to the show to be able to relate to the work on a both personal and a collective um, level. Um, and so, therefore, I then, which led me to inviting. Anselm Philippa, Shaisa and Rayhan um, to show their work and brings in a, a wider community than I think what a traditional space would um, and, I, and I do believe that since the opening that we have drawn in people to the show that would not necessarily attend a gallery space and come see a particular exhibition but more so now that the work that we are showing here it allows people to be able to relate to it. It allows communities to be able to relate to it, whether it's touching on um, growing up in Peckham or whether it's growing up with, in an area with a community developing around um, the East London Mosque, for example, or whether we are looking at memory in terms of uh, loss, or whether it's possessions or personal loss. Um, so, and and that, was, that was what I wanted for the show, really, to be able to to be able to put together a show that a wide group of people would be able to relate to and not just a smaller audience. Thank you, Simon. And there was evidence of that with, um, in the last few days with your work, Anselm, where people who you photograph come in to see themselves, oh, there's me. <laughs> so uh, um, obviously it's, a, it's um, a project which engages with the people that you know and uh, related in your community around you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, the, well, my name's Anson. Thank you everybody for coming down today. Um, I am a photographer, photography documentary. Um, recently com completed my MA and my project was at Horizon Ongoing Project. So what you see on the wall is kind of a small segment of a wider body of work. And um, yeah, the, the, the way the project kind of manifests, I kind of see it as two different elements. So I'm kind of exploring the memory of the area through the landscape and the built environment. And I'm really interested in how a people can leave a mark on a space even if they're not in the space. So when I'm photographing the area, I'm really interested in those elements of um, what you see, even though you can't see the people in it. And it's also kind of an expression of my own personal connection to the area. I've lived, lived in Peckham my whole life and I've seen how it's changed over time. Um, and, you know, I do remember a time when um, the perception of Peckham socially and in the media was wholly negative. So mm -hmm. it's, um, I'm interested in playing with the perception of how people see the area as well and then the other side of it is the community so um, where, I put, where I have the portraits you know some people I know most people that I encounter in the streets um, 
that's my attempt to engage with the community and um, also ask questions in the wider black community specifically about how they feel about how the area has changed over time and um, kind of explore those those thoughts and feelings and where they align with mine and where they differ. So I find it really interesting as well. Yeah, thank you. And Philippa, your, your work explores uh, the memory of very real events, but through fictional representations. And I wonder if you want to talk about that. And, and, uh, yeah, so um, I'm Philippa, and I'm studying uh, MA in Photography at Falmouth. And it's, so this is my work here. Uh, it's called Unqualified, and it's about um, feeling basically unqualified um, uh, after my father died. Um, and it's fictional in the sense that, so they're all self-portraits, um, but I'm not in them. So I don't know if they are technically self-portraits, but um, it was like a series which was very much phototherapy. Um, and uh, I felt really like I didn't know how to deal with grief. And so this project really helped me, I don't know, understand it and analyze it and be with it and that kind of have peace with it. And so I created these self-portraits of uh, as if they were me as a as a little girl because that's how I felt. I felt like I didn't have the skills um, to deal with such big emotions, and I I just felt like I I had to kind of step in my father's shoes and almost take over kind of the patriarch of the family. But at the same time, I just wanted to curl up because my dad had died. Do you know what I mean, so it was this like conflict. That's why, like this one here, where she's driving the car, she's, it's, it's, it's quite metaphorical, my work, or well, this series is. Um, and so and I was exploring memory, so a lot of these, so there's one girl in there who's um, smoked a cigarette, which obviously what I did as a, as a teenager, not obviously, but I did. <laughs> um, you know, and so, you know, whereas these days, children are children, kids, teenagers are, are vaping. So it's very much, you know, memories from mine, but it's kind of, so they've, they're created memories and they're exhibited in these little like what are they called like light boxes slide slide, slide, views. slide views thank you <laughs> um which i didn't realize so my my fellow artists many of them didn't hadn't seen one before so but it was you know i was brought up with these slide viewers and that was kind of my upbringing and, and that's the relationship i had with my father so everything's kind of tightly uh in sync with kind of memories with my father and stuff like that. Yes, thank you, thank you for that. And, and Shasta, your, your work in, engages with the idea of collective memory in some way, and it is it, it, an intervention. And also, it's not what we traditionally would understand as photography, though it, in, in many ways it belongs in a photographic exhibition. Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I have a very complicated relationship with photography. I think my natural reaction at the moment is not to work with still images. Um, this project came about um, after, well, actually it was a couple of years ago around this time of the year, Ramadan. Um, I had had a really spiritually uplifting month and you know, contemplating things to do with nature and um, the signs of God in nature, as we're told um, in the Quran. And um, I emerged on a spiritual high and um, came back to the real world. <laughs> back to work and um, I've been studying and researching Islamophobia which I have done since 9-11 um, because of the very fractious circumstances that Muslims find themselves in ever since then, before then as well but obviously um, heightened ever since. Um, and so I came back, I came out of Ramadan with this um, spiritual high, I was like I cannot read um, this stuff that I've been collecting. So I've been collecting um, from charity shops, um, books, um, Islamophobic books. Uh, books filled with anti-Muslim hate and I just looked at them and I was like I don't think I can read these now um, because one of the points of Ramadan is also the softening of the heart and I feel that that kind of research actually in a way was hardening my heart so um, I decided um, I can't read these books and I was brought up um, thinking that you know being taught that books are sacred you don't throw books away you respect them um, knowledge is sacred but I thought well I'm not going to read them uh, I'm certainly not going to give them to somebody else to read and I'm not going to destroy them. What can I do that's productive? Um, and I mentioned before that I have a complicated relationship with imagery, um, with photography specifically. Um, in a previous life, I worked as a photojournalist um, and I moved away from that. And ever since, for 
three things to do with objectification of poverty and the way black and brown people are depicted in the development work, development sector that I was working in. So to cut a very long story short, um, I decided to use this paper to conduct experiments in my practice. So um, trying things I'd never done before. So cyanotypes is one of the processes that I've used, photographic process. Um, I've done other experiments and I'm trying still to use the paper that I have in these stack of books that I have at home to just try something new um, and to connect with my faith and my spiritual practice at the same time. It's very connected with the work that I'm producing with this paper, while also experimenting with my practice. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And, and Rehan, you also um, turned your lens on the community and um, what, what, what I, I found ex extraordinary as well is that the, the selection of works that uh, you've selected uh, to show here in the gallery, it's just a very small selection of a kind of archive of, um, of photographs you have of, 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 of that community. And um, it, it's really interesting as well to see how that lens has a very particular frame to it. To um, and, and the, the, the 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 content of the pictures tells um, narratives other than maybe another photographer would 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 um, uh, tell of that of, of, of that very same community. So I you know be interested to hear about your approach there. I mean it's it, it's it's an archive of one particular community in Tower Hamlets. Um, it didn't start off like that. It was an end of year college uh, project. Uh, I was doing um, photography, A level, and uh, I had to do 12 pictures on an interesting story. And uh, I chose the East London Mosque, which, which is like that picture there. That's when I started. So it's got, now it's got the London Muslim Centre and the Marion Centre for Women and all sorts of other things happening there. But, um, then it was just this domed mosque, uh, very small, um, and the community was very small. There, was, there, was, there wasn't that many people. Uh, no one really knew what went on inside the mosque, and that, that was my initial project, what goes on behind uh, those doors. Um, and then it just grew and grew, and it went on for 10 years. Uh, the mosque kept growing. It's still growing. They've got another expansion happening now. Um, uh, and I got more and more interested in doing quite graphic images uh, of particular things um, and, and, and looking at them in quite a lot of detail. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted to have the record of my community and my faith um, shot by me um, rather than a photographer who wasn't from the community shooting, shooting my people, in, in a way, uh, I, I, I like the idea of me doing it. My, my connection to the mosque is my dad in the, in the sort of late 70s and early, early 80s had his factory sort of opposite the mosque. Uh, and I actually watched, watched the, the domes being fitted. So there was, there was probably a, an early connection to, to it. Um, and it just carried on. The, the project Are you still photographing it? Yeah, not in, not, in, not in black and white film, though. It's just too expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, the mosque actually has a strong room, uh, which is temperature controlled, moisture controlled, everything. It's, uh, it was put together with the help of the National Archives. Uh, so all the negatives are stored there, um, and, which is quite nice for me. Um, uh, others can also store their stuff there, too. Um, I think it, thank you. It, I think it'd be really interesting further on in the discussion to pick up this idea of uh, archive and memory. And Seema, yeah, do you want to talk um, a bit more? Because you gave us sort of an introduction to the show, but would you like to talk a, a bit more about your? Um, yes. Yeah, so the work here on the left, on my left, <laughs> um, is called Lost in the Soot. Um, the work didn't come about like a traditional project would usually. I didn't spend months planning or researching. Um, unfortunately, we had a, a 
fluke accident um, in our home and we had a fire. Um, and I was traumatised like most people would be after having a fire and I wasn't quite sure how to deal with my grief. Um, and around that time, I think I was out with Ansel one evening and I said to him, I, I really want to photograph inside my home and I really want to photograph myself inside my home, um, which is a separate project to what's being shown here. Um, and I, I just felt, I think it was my only way of being able to drill, deal with the trauma that I was experiencing. Um, the, the sadness and the grief of losing my son's childhood was probably the biggest um, thing for me. Um, as a mother or as a parent, we often hold on to all those little things like their first baby grows, their first uh, drawing, and all of that was destroyed. Um, and, I, and I found myself longing to want to be in that space even though it was destroyed because it would allow me to relive that life before it, it was completely removed from me. Um, and so it was the process of dealing with an insurance company who, um, or a disaster recovery company as they call them themselves, uh, who came in to audit my home. So they were auditing all of our possessions from the number of socks that we had, baby grows and adding value um, to our possessions. And, it was at that point I started questioning the value that we put on our possessions and the value that others would put on those possessions. So, for example, they might have uh, valued the price of my father's hat or late father's hat at seven pounds. But for me, that hat held far greater value. Um, and in some ways it was, it, it's, it was part of my identity that no longer existed. Um, and, and that was what I was feeling with the loss of the entire home. Um, and so when I actually started making this work, I, I thought that it, when I started making the work, it was actually the process of going from darkness back into light. So the 10 month journey of restoring the home, buying new possessions, refilling the home, taking my son back in for the first time. Um, but what we actually see here at the moment um, is a very small collection of the images, I guess, or a, a, a particular edit, which is technically about seven to 10 days after the fire itself. Um, and I have displayed um, one, say one, one of my wedding dresses, which we was able to recover. <laughs> We're Asian, we have five events. <laughs> okay. It's just standard. Um, and here, which is, um, David calls it the moon rock, is actually a, a cutout of my son's toy boxes. So we had, where the fire started, it was eight toy boxes that melted down um, and the insurance company could see that I was very distraught by the fact that Thomas no longer existed or the Thomas tracks were melted and so they cut me a piece um, of his toys to keep. Um, and those are the things that we recovered from such a great loss. And, um, over the years, I think my, my relationship with the work has changed because, and I, and I don't mean to sound patronising or undermining, but it, it's kind of very similar to grief, how over a period of time your relationship with that grief changes as well, or the way you feel about that particular grief or that loss. Um, and I think that's what's happened here with this work, hence there's so many <laughs> various edits of it. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Seema. By the way, we should say that Thomas is the tank engine, <laughs> not the child. No. The child's still very much well. Yeah, yeah sure, he's fine. He's six years old. It drives me mad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, Thomas is a, a, a tank engine. I, I, think, I think it's interesting that there's a strong narrative element in this display, and I think... It, Tom, Thomas features in there as well. Yeah, and I think in... in in both yours and Philippus, obviously, there's this, this, there's this uh, use of narrative to deal with trauma. So I, I wonder if you wanted to talk a little bit about that, maybe with you, Philippa, at first. Uh, yeah, there is. I mean, my project isn't even finished because uh, I guess I got so far and, and it kind of did its job, <laughs> if you like. Um, and it really, you know, it was 
the work was like a therapist, if you like. Um, and I think art is can be generally anyway. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, so it kind of did its job and and really helped me through the process of grief. And almost it's become like a bit like what you're saying, Seema. Like, after a certain amount of time, it's not. You know, my relationship with the work is very different. I, it was never going to be shown anywhere. Like, it wasn't made to be shown. It was made. I don't know. Do you mean? It's quite interesting that their handheld, sort of very intimate mm. relationship with the image, and both your and Seema's image are created by light shining through them. Yeah, which I think and we didn't actually discuss that, did we? No. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is interesting. Did you did you feel some affinity with with uh, with Seema's display? And the, the yeah, I mean, the, so the I mean, obviously. Seema, you're the greatest curator, but I love the fact that they're opposite each other as well. And mine is what I call the white wall, because you don't actually know that anything's on there until you go and investigate. Um, so it's quite interactive. And I think um, the intimacy is part of it as well, because it's um, it's Greek. And I think, I think it's universal as well. I think even if you haven't experienced grief, you could imagine what that potentially could be like. Do you know what I mean? So it's got this, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a personal project, but I think it's obviously a universal theme, um, and it's quite interesting how people deal with grief in very different ways and, and curate art and stuff. And how about the narrative construction of your images? I mean, is there an order to the way they they're being placed on the walls, and is that to be read as such? Um, there is in in some respects, um, but I wanted I wanted people to be able to walk through the home. And I wanted, I wanted people to be able to relate to the different spaces and the connections that we have with homes. Um, and I mean, we start with the first image. A lot of people don't quite recognise is actually a fire web. Um, and those webs are formed when heat. This is very scientific. Uh, heat travels into a cold space, um, and the webs. The complexity of the webs tends to dictate the complexity of the fire. Um, and we were told that um, by the investigators that the one of the guys had been working in the industry for 17 years and it was the most complex form of soot damage he'd seen in a home. Um, so for me, that those fire webs that had formed throughout the home and I thought, oh my God, it looks like I've got cobwebs everywhere. <laughs> Um, were actually were actually fire webs um, due to the the level of disaster that was um, created, and I think for that reason I used that image to start because it it probably lends itself the best in terms of the disaster that it caused in our in our lives, I guess, um, and. And really, I just wanted people to be able to enter into the space. Um, it does get slightly lighter as things are being removed. Um, so from the point we go into the kitchen and the hallway, um, just so that we are able to experience that we did recover from it and we do recover from grief in some ways. And whether we recover from it or whether we learn how to live with it and deal with it, it's, it's two different things. But there is a change in that process, and I think that's what I wanted the images to show. Yes, the final one is the empty, the empty room. Yeah. Where so is that once everything has been removed? Or... Um, yeah, so it was after everything had been removed, um, after my entire home had been audited and put into black bin bags and uh, disposed in the back of a van, and off it went to the tip, sort of thing. Um, so that was after everything had been removed and the walls had been wiped down. For then, for then the construction companies to come in and take away uh, or remove back to the walls um, and restart rebuilding, sorry, the home. Um, yeah, so I guess it's probably the last stage before re bringing back light into the home. So. And Rehan, your, your, I mean. The your archive of photographs contains many stories, I imagine. Uh, where does stories and storytelling uh, play a part in, in, in your work? I, I shot so much. Uh, 
spent the 10 years, um, even I became a bit lost in it. Um, it was, I was very young at the time. I was only 19 when I started um, on this project. No, actually I was younger, uh, 94, I was younger than that. Um, and it was a really nice time to just have one camera, two lenses, film, and just just shoot whatever I saw. That was, that was nice. I was talking to us earlier uh, about the, the access, uh, I think in the little statement it says about access. Shooting a Muslim community, any, anyone who knows Tower Hamlets, uh, if you're looking back 20 years, uh, getting access to photographs inside a mosque would have been really, really difficult at that time. It, it was difficult, uh, even I couldn't get access initially. They, they refused, and I said it was for a college project, and they said, no, you can't do it, people would be upset. And then um, they started their expansion project, and it, it the, 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 the dynamic changed, I guess. They, they needed me a bit more than I needed them. So it kind of worked out okay, and then it, the, the relationship developed, and now they have film crews in there, and photographers in there almost every Friday. Um, uh, but back then, it was very difficult to actually move around the mosque with a camera and take pictures of quite intimate areas where people are washing um, and, and be really up close, uh, getting access to children's classes. Like, again, uh, I, I had, didn't have DVS at the time or anything like that. And just, yeah, go and, go and do it. Um, so it was... Didn't even have email at that time. <laughs> Nine, <laughs> was that email did exist, didn't it? No. Well, I didn't have a computer, but yeah. You're the same age as me. Twenty-one. Yeah. What was the question again? So <laughs> stories. <laughs> stories. Lots of stories. I mean, yeah, I'm there's there's so many. Know. There's there's so. I mean, there's so many stories, right? There's. I, I photographed. The community wanted uh, male circumcision for Muslim boys. It's it's compulsory. So there was back back rooms, you know, converted them. Kids just have the circumcision done, and then the, the community got together and said, "No, why don't the NHS at the Royal London? Why don't they offer it as a paid service?" So I went along to the NHS and I photographed male circumcision, um, uh, Sainsbury's wow. uh, Muslim women serving non-halal meat in Sainsbury's. Sainsbury's really nice. I said, "Yeah, go on, shoot it if you want." Um, that the helipad at, at, um, at the Royal London. Um, that was in its early phases at that time, uh, and they, they allowed me to sort of photograph that. Um, the markets and how the markets, how the mosque growing um, was changing the neighborhood. Mm. Uh, everything went halal food. Uh, the markets went from being 50 50 white stall holders um, and everyone else to pretty much everyone is now either Bangladeshi, Somali, or Algerian. Uh, in Whitechapel. It's, it's a thriving market, it's brilliant, um, but there's only one type of person selling stuff there. So, so, so much changed with the mosque's expansion, it just, it, there's just so many stories, you yeah. can shoot all day long. Um, there's so and much you look at them and each one seems to be a story. Uh, mm. it's, uh, it's yeah, there's, there's an interesting one. Of, yeah, when I, when, I, I, first, one, when right? I first exhibited <laughs> that at Rich Mix, um, the, the the white guy, his grandson, kicked up a fuss and Rich Mix phoned me up and they said, oh, someone's seen it. Um, and it was the day of the launch. And they're very un unhappy about the picture. They say it's their, it's their, it's their father or, or grandfather at the time. They say. I said, all right, I'll pop along and have a chat with him. And I, and I said, oh, what's the problem? He goes, oh, that's my granddad. I said, what's the problem? Um, and he goes, oh, um, does he know you took the picture? I said, well, yeah. I mean, because I asked him. Uh, and uh, anyway, I said, anyway, who's your dad? Um, and he said, oh, so and so. I said, go call your dad. And it turned out I knew who his dad was, so it was all right. So, um, and I spoke to his, his, his dad and I said, oh, I don't think your, your dad was upset about me taking a picture because there was, I mean, I shot a whole roll of film on these two. Um, and um, he goes, no, he goes, we've moved out the area. We're in Essex now, but he goes, I've just called my dad and, and I've taken a picture of it and sent it to him. He says he wants to come and see the exhibition and he misses the East End so much and all his neighbours, they're, they're neighbours. The yeah, no, they look um, like they're neighbours. And, um, uh, and he, he just said, you know, he missed the area and it's how it's changed 
um, when he does come back, but he still wants to move back, but he can't because he sold the house. Um, and now he can't, can't, can't afford it, yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah. There's, there's lots, lots, so many different little stories um, within, within, I mean, Samantha Mumba, the pop star, the Irish pop star. There was a time in the East End where if you had, um, the Kaiser's laughing, because um, he knows if you, if you, uh, if the billboards went up and there was a sort of a semi, not even nude, it's like a woman revealing a little bit. Yeah, arms even, you know, someone would go along and spray paint me or hijabify them like they've done there. So they put the little hijab across them and, and, and stuff. Uh, and it, it must have been a little group of, I'd say, boys uh, who went around doing this, uh, but it was quite funny. Um, uh, I, I, I found it really funny anyway. They had the, um, I think it was um, Wonder Bra used to do a lot of adverts mm. uh, in the in the late nineties, and but they never did one in Whitechapel. I was yeah, waiting. Really? I really was waiting for it. Uh, Sensibly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it never happened. So I, the only one I could do was the Samantha Mumble. Yeah. And and someone was wondering if we could stand that, please stand that, and talk about people telling their story through your photograph and and how that worked. Or like people in the community, you mean? yeah, yeah. I think um, it's interesting. I think I, I'm I'm still working through the project, and I'm still, you know, I, I'll, I'll be working on it this year. And um, I just walk around uh, the area, and you know, I'm most of the time stopping people, um, just explaining what I'm doing, you know, explaining my perspective and where I'm coming from, and seeing if there's any interest in the portrait being made. And often I'm, uh, I'm making the portrait there and then, and then offering to have a conversation at a later date, or, or you know, if they have time there and then. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. I think um, something that I found really interesting about the dynamic within the black community in Peckham and the people that I've been speaking to is how the opinions of the change that they perceive in the area or the feelings that come from that change differ depending on the age of the person that I speak to. So mm -hmm. I've spoken to older people who perhaps don't feel as threatened by it because, um, you know, older members of the black community who perhaps came here by the Windrush generation, you know, way back in the 50s or the economic migrants from West Africa who came here, they often have a kind of idealized home which isn't on the continent, isn't on the UK. Mm -hmm. And so they don't have that same kind of connection. Whereas younger people, you know, myself and the millennial, I was born in the UK, um, there's a lot more, there's a, there's a more visceral reaction to seeing your neighborhood and your area change around you um, in perhaps ways that don't particularly or maybe don't accommodate you. So that's really interesting. But um, I kind of feel that there's, it, it's it, it's mostly positive, you know, in terms of the connection to the area and, and the feeling of community in the area, uh, which is which has been nice. And it does, I find the conversations myself quite um, quite enriching. So I, I, I'm looking forward to going out this year and having more conversations and seeing what I find. You know, I find that I find that quite interesting. So yeah. it, it's it's been great to have people who. who uh, in your photograph, um, coming in to see the to the show. Yeah, well. that's um, yeah. I mean, that's always that's rewarding for myself, anyway. Um, you know, I, I I really enjoy portraits. I like I love making portraits, but I'm I'm not particularly one who enjoys being in front of the camera. So whenever somebody agrees to have a portrait made of them, I take it as a great privilege. And so, um, you know, we live in a very digitized environment with AI imagery now. So um, uh, print photography is almost archaic in a way. And so it's nice to, that people can have their portrait made. And you know, in the moment, you don't really know what's gonna happen, whether you're ever gonna see it again. And then you might see it on Instagram, or you, you know, but that's not the same as coming in person, seeing the print mm -hmm. and appreciating it, particularly within the context of the area. So seeing pictures of the area in Peckham and, and being in the community and, seeing yourself in that, I think that's, that's quite, that's nice to see that reaction from people. So, yeah. Are you shooting a film? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, Did your mum do it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think my mum has come in yet. Yeah. 
but um, she will be at some point. <laughs> she's yeah, in one of, she's not just in, generally has your mum come, but she is, but she in, is one in one of the pictures. Yeah, she's, um, yeah. <laughs> and Shaston, on the, on the issue of narrative and the idea of narrative, and obviously you, you also sort of working in contradiction to the narrative or intervening with the narrative language. Do you want to talk a bit about that process? And, uh, yeah, I think one of the conversations we have had about the layout of my work was the page numbers and how I've done different experiments at different times and I've just been ripping out pages randomly. So it's kind of anti-narrative in that even the pages, the way that they're laid out and what I've done with them is in like complete wrong order. Um, I think um, for me, we've talked a bit about kind of healing. I think there's definitely a thread of healing in, in, in the work, um, kind of taking a step back and thinking about um, for example, you know, the post 9-11 context for Muslims, where so many Muslims have not really been able to um, to process how, as a collective, I would say we have been targeted um, mm. and penalised and punished for something that really isn't representative of our communities. Um, and I think that it's only now, even with myself, I'm stepping back and thinking there's a lot of healing that needs to be done. And I recognise that in myself, but also on a larger level that there needs to be that collective healing as well in the space to process what's you know what's happened since since then um but it's um it's a kind of double layer because also it's highly connected to my own religious practice as well mm -hmm. because also the project emanated from that spiritual high in ramadan and so you know any practice that i'm experiments that i'm conducting they are very much related to some sort of religious practice as well whether it's contemplative or um, there's a lot of natural elements in it, nature, going back to nature, um, because going back to the Islamic tradition, um, going back to nature is one of the biggest signs of creation and being at one with creation. So it's kind of a double, double kind of layered thing there. There's that healing element, um, but there's also going back to um, a personal, private, religious practice, which again, in you know, it's so uncool to, to be religious now or to say that you practice a religion or that you find peace and comfort and, and you love a, your religious practice. So I'm kind of almost embracing that element and and, and, en and enjoying it. Thank you. Uh, can, can I just turn things, uh, um, the subject now to the, to the issue of archives and the relationship between the subject of this exhibition, which is um, around memory and loss, and the idea of the archive, because obviously photography is long had this very um, um, strong conceptual relationship with the idea of the archive. Um, and we've already talked about archive as well in relation to Ibrahim's practice particularly. But Shaisa, as well, in your, in, in your practice, I, I guess you're, again, engaging with an archive of material. And so you're, you're working within the archive as well as uh, working mm -hmm. a, against this particular I, I kind of like to call it speaking back, and that's kind of um, what my wider practice, so this is one strand of my practice, and um, my PhD research also deals with existing archives, usually of images, and using them to speak back, and this work is also similar to that. So I feel like if we're linking it to archive generally, I would say it's disrupting the archive um, that does exist, perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and in terms of your work, I mean, you talked about when when the lost justice went through and they listed all the lost items in a way, and these photographs have a have a connection to, to that in some way. So, you know, how does that kind of listed idea of a, of a of a house full of stuff and and, and these relate? You know, that kind of the kind of archival concept of 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 a whole series of memories that have now just become heard. So the, arch the archival process, as we say, started with uh, the auditing that happened through insurance companies of auditing our possessions. Um, and I think, I, my, I guess I took that one step further with photographing those possessions which then became, I guess, an archival memory of the belongings that once existed or things that were a part of our identity. Um, 
I'm not I'm not fully sure to be honest. I'm not not really thought of it in that sort of respect. I, I, obviously it's it's an archive of my memory and identity, but um, I no, became no. so obsessed with freezing that space for myself, um, and my son had never actually seen those images nor realised what happened to the house until about three weeks ago when he was like, Mummy, is that our home? Wow. Um, so I guess in some ways it's an archive for him to look back at to, as he's older now, he'll be able to understand it. Um, at the time he he was too young to understand or to, to even be explained to, but, and, and now he questions it. And I guess you're right, um, that by documenting them at home and though keeping or restoring those possessions, they've become archives that he'll be able to reflect back on, or we would be able to reflect back on as a family, um, and, and, and to be able to look back and understand that point in our life. Mm. So. Yeah, yeah, I, it, I, I actually, I had a friend whose house burned down when he was in his early teens, and um, so he, he had nothing from his, from his childhood, yeah. and, and I guess in a way, um, what you've done here is you've replaced that thing with, with something else, yeah. with a, which is a record of, of the event. Yeah. I mean, it, it's funny you say that because Yashua asked me the other day if I had uh, if I had the scan of him as a baby when he was in my tummy, and I froze for a moment because I didn't know if I did have that anymore. Um, but I had a, a picture of the picture, and I guess that was the archive that I was able to give to him. But I then said to him, I'll have to go into the loft and look through the restored boxes to see if I have a scan of you, you know. But yeah, so I guess in, in some respects that's what I was doing. I, I guess I was creating without even realising an archive for him to then be able to look back at his childhood that no longer existed. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I guess for, the, for, for you, I mean, that, that, that record is a record of events that... Well, they kind of happen because you, 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 I mean, you obviously had that childhood. Yeah. But well, you, you recreated it. Exactly. Yeah. So I think when someone, when a family member dies, the first thing you do is look at the family archive, the family albums. You know, they come out and I don't know. I, I mean, I did a lot of kind of research on it and, you know, what's in your family album? Is that really the memories that you remember or? Sometimes you don't even remember it and it's the photo that triggers it or sometimes that looks like a really happy picture but you remember two seconds later it was fucking carnage and everyone's like having a little throat. Do you know what I mean? And so, yeah, so I guess I've kind of recreated the family, not necessarily the family album, but I guess I've recreated the archive in terms of bits that have helped me deal with grief. Although, I mean, not all of them are here, but some of them are quite ugly, do you know what I mean? And quite um, disturbing, I guess, because like everyone's family has, you know, dark secrets and, you know, it's 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 not it's not all pretty, like the family album kind of is. So it's kind of going against that kind of traditional archive of what you keep, you know, and creating mine, which, as I said, wasn't for show, but it was a form of therapy to kind of get the skeletons out of the closet and create my own art. And I guess that we look at these these memories through some sort of instrument is a bit like um, it, it, it gives us almost a kind of scientific relationship to that history like we're looking at things through a microscope or that's something true. like that. Yeah, so, that, yeah that's, so it, that's it, great. I'll write that down. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't thought because I've never shown it. So um, it's a really intriguing way to relate to some of yeah. else's memories and what's in, in inside the like you know like just going a bit deeper and i guess the past has a kind of geography to it and it's sort of interesting to think about the way you kind of map out geography of your past through the photographs and hands you're yeah. you're dealing with a, a physical geography of space and place and then you're you know people who know the area will be able can recognize things very easily and yeah so. yeah i think um I think when, when thinking about archive and by extension memory, um, it's it's a really distinct element about you know, that, about you know it's a really distinct element of what makes us human. You know, it's how we preserve and how we 
um, document something, um, if it's a family album, um, or even if it's a burnt down house, it's something that a family member can connect and um, really pinpoint part of their identity to. And so when thinking about photographing a space, and I mean, with the environments I am photographing, there's a, there's a very kind of curated element in the fact that I'm referencing very specific things, right? So I'm really interested in how, um, like I mentioned before, perception, for example. Um, I'm aware of a wider perception of heaven that has existed you know, across the timeline of my time, of the time that I've lived there. Um, negative and perhaps positive in some ways. And I'm interested in how the way I photograph the area can shift that, perspective, um, that perception, for mm -hmm. example. So what, is it, what does it say about an area that might have been deemed as the ghetto if it's um, photographed in beautiful sunlight and in these pictures, right? Um, what, does it, what, what are the layers um, in photographing boundaries in an area like that? Mm -hmm. What are, the, what are the questions that arise from what could be considered exotic in that space? So I'm really interested in dealing with all these personal elements when I photograph in that space. But conversely, when thinking about archive, I think it's really important to center myself in a time and place, like thinking about what Ray Hunter said recently, with um, the guy who's moved to Essex and used to go back, but we can't mm -hmm. afford to go back. So I think it's really important to um, place myself in Peckham and in the here and now, and also the black community as well, in the here and now of Epic. And so, um, in a sense, I'm kind of making an archive or making a statement mm -hmm. that these people were here in the space. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important that, you know, the people that I do photograph um, either live in Peckham at the time that I photograph them or have lived in Peckham for a long period of time um, or spend a lot of time in the area. Um, um, because I, I do hope that in the future, um, when the work is looked back on, it might say something about how that space has changed in that time. So, um, I think there's, there's a, a very formal um, pared down content to your photographs. I mean, so, so the photographs formally have very similar construction, one from another. And that's quite interesting if you're, when you're thinking about making a record of, of, of a space, that, yeah. that somehow the, the, um, the framing is. It's always the same. It, it's a sub, even if the subject is different to each. Yeah, it's interesting. It's difficult because it's because it's a work in progress, um, and because the selection on display um, in the Stephen Lawrence Gallery is a very um, select selection of a wide body of work that is still ongoing. Um, it's interesting to kind of think about how, you know, I've, I've obviously picked those pictures to display on the wall, um, and there is a formality to the way those pictures represent and relate to one another. But um, there are, you know, I, there are other ways to kind of express the space and the people, and, and that might change, and that can flip the way you might look at the area, or the way you might look at the formality of all the images I put together. Um, I think, in my experience as a photographer, I think um, something that I'm really interested in um, is how sequencing can really shift and change narratives and change the way we. Um, perceive a particular place or perceive a body of work, right? So um, archive, as a, as a archive, it, it, it acts in a different way, but if as a body of work, you can you can manipulate that and, and tell different narratives and different stories with the way you can place them. So yeah. it's hard to kind of like nail down a particular formality when I know the body of work is still ongoing, but I do appreciate that that is what that is there, that element is there. Yeah, I mean, I, I, Alan, Alan Sifula uh, says that the archive talks of the archive as a territory of images and it talks about the, the kind of contested narratives that can be uh, traced through, through that territory. And I mean, talking in, in particular about, you know, ar 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 photographic archives, which are there to serve a number of different audiences. And, I, and I'm, Rehan, I'm, I mean, I'm sort of interested because you've, you've got the archive now, haven't you? You've got, I mean, this is, this is an archive of a community and we've talked about the stories. And, and is it something you see in a kind of 
geographical sense, it's about a geographical area that is indeed like a territory or that you can map out. Oh, I, I, I think sort. archives are rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell, tell you why. I'll tell you why. Right. Okay, right. So since since sort of like Black Lives Matter happened, okay, yeah. all the archives have been clamoring around with themselves to sort of say, oh, let's do scanning sessions of communities and let's get pictures of the 90s of, say, Asian communities. Bring your, bring your, bring your pictures and we'll scan them for you. Give you a scan of your uh, of your picture, and we'll add to our archive, and then we'll control your history. Mm. Almost, I'll throw it out there. Probably ninety percent of people working in archives, museums, and galleries are white, middle class, and then they're going to control my archive. Someone asked me to put deposit this archive into theirs, mm. and say yeah, we'll, we'll look after it. And I said, oh, the mosque has its own archive. I don't need you. Um, and their answer was like, yeah, but you know, most people come to us to look at it, look at the work. And I said, I don't need most people. I've got my own community, and they can look at it. And if anyone else wants to come and look at it, they can. Um, so I think, I think, I think it's really important for marginalised communities to to document their own communities because only they can do it in an accurate way um, and in a fair way. I think what I did was fair. I don't think I I made it all rosy and it's all nice. I think I did a fairly balanced um, document of of a particular time of a particular community. Um, and I think it's probably not so important now, but maybe in 20, 30 years time, it'll probably be quite it'll probably be quite important then. Um, I think, it's I think it is. Yeah, yeah, but it's Absolutely not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not, it's not um, Think about your kids. When you show them, you tell the story of how the, the area has developed, how things have changed, yeah. the, the connection that you had with the physical space because of the factory across the road, and you saw the, the dome being installed. Yeah. So it's important, even as part of your own history here growing mm. up. And also, I mean, what you're talking about is something that I'm quite interested in as well, is making work for our own communities, mm -hmm. which historically has just not been a thing. So it's what you're doing is is really important, but now but the longer term. So yeah. it needs to continue, but it, it's a good starting point. Yeah. It's already a, a yeah, it's already a piece of history. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying it'll be more important later on. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think yeah. that you know, I mean, I, I look back in the, uh, the '94 shots, and you can see cars that you don't see anymore, yeah, yeah. which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, <coughs> I think I think from an aesthetic point of view, yeah, I think photography has a unique relationship with, with the temporal where, you know, as, as time continues and shifts, um, it you know, that, that nostalgic effect is really strong. Mm -hmm. But I think um, to what Rayhan is saying, the importance of documenting our own communities is extremely important and pertinent. I mean if you look at like memory work and telling our own stories and telling the truth as well. If you look at in the United States, where there's, um, and even in the UK with um, Kenny Benedict and all the conservatives trying to ban critical race theory, for example, that's happening now. And it's like we're talking about the critical ways we, we engage with racism or um, marginalized communities or historic horrors, right? Um, so that work is important right now. Um, and, you know, visually, the way we tell those stories. I agree with Rayhan, they'll become even more important in the future. But um, yeah, it's important that we're, we're telling those stories, that there are a variety of voices within those demographics telling those stories. So um, Asian women, black women, uh, queer, queer people. Um, it's, it's, I think all of that is important, but um, it's important right now. So. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Very good. I think this is a good point maybe to, to widen the discussion to uh, questions from the audience. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, thank you. Um, should I start? Oh, yeah. So, say the work speaks back to this number of this number of the text, um, and I don't know if you have to say that, and in my mind, it's a part of a tradition of reclaiming the process of knowledge for the audience, and as a sort of like liberating the captive. Are there any artists from thinkers who are influenced by why you're creating the work? Oh, wow. Um, not specifically in um, the physical creation of a silo type, but um, 
ideologically, um, one of the things I've been really enjoying is um, artists making work about black joy, for example, and people not wanting to engage with that kind of traumatic imagery. Um, black feminist thinkers who have paved the way for so many of us. So in terms of the thought process behind it and not wanting to expose myself, my heart, and to kind of always perpetuate those texts as they are, that's kind of, those sorts of people have kind of um, set that tone in the direction I wanted to go in. Yeah, it's an ongoing uh, project. It's going to be ongoing forever because I have stacks of Islamophobic books that I've got loads of experiments wow. to do. <laughs> um, um, we'll, we'll see how we go. We'll see if I run out of steam. But as I mentioned that I was a self-trained photojournalist, so anything that I'm doing now as I expand to a wider visual arts practice, it's all me trying things. I've not been taught how to do anything. So um, the, the possibilities are endless. Uh, but some of the other stuff that I've been doing... Um, is paper folding. I'm interested in sculptural so work, so I've been making little lanterns oh, with wow. light, it's almost light shining through. Um, I've used geometric experiments, so going back to kind of um, traditional Islamic arts, which um, are geometric in nature, and they all, all hop back to the oneness of God and, and the way that the calculate. Anyway, I won't bore you with the details because I'm not trained either. So there's so many different things I'm trying. Um, I have a residency in Cambridge at the moment as well, where I'm trying printmaking. Um, as much as I kind of not necessarily making photographic images per se at the moment, I have done a test print on the paper as well. Woo! So watch this space, who knows? <laughs> so yeah, possibilities are endless and I could go on and on and on forever, <laughs> I think. Okay. Yeah, I, I have a question for everyone. First of all, thank you. between the work and something I was really struck by, obviously, is the way you're all kind of traveling the archive as this like static, kind of disembodied thing. And when you have the word embodiment, I think you think of like, feelings of emotion and belonging in all of the work. Um, and I also think of like, photography as kind of this missing and unembodied practice when actually the photographer is always taking pictures, making pictures. So I'd love to hear you all talk about your own kind of like the, the physical practice of, of making I mentioned like photography having kind of like a unique relationship with the temporal and having like a document of time and, and you know having a, a record of that and I I, I photograph um, I use analog cameras to make most of my personal work and so that involves the physical negative and um, you know eventually printing and maybe being in a dark room but I haven't done much of that yet um, but conversely another another element of um, the work that I'm doing that I enjoy comes not really in the photo making at all. So it's kind of um, with engaging in the community. So it's not really anything to do with photography. And I find that really interesting and challenging to myself. You know, like, so uh, what does what does it mean to be of the community? What does it mean to engage with, with the community? And um, in West African culture, a lot of the way that we share stories and a lot of the way that we a lot of the way that we share information is orally, so having conversations is a natural mm -hmm. part of that. So recording that uh, element is um, another facet of kind of like embodying the, the archive making. So I'd say in that respect, so that's, that's where it relates to me. But I'll open it up to <laughs> the rest of my... Well, I guess the way... Um, yeah, that, it's a really interesting question. So I, so I work digitally, and I work very fast usually, and because uh, I really wanted to slow down because of the subject matter of this project. Um, uh, a friend bought me actually a lens which was just for very old film cameras, so you had to like manually focus it, and I had to have a tripod. So it, like I kind of like on purpose made everything to like slow me down and to stop. And I designed the photos which I work in portraiture normally and documentary kind of. So um, I planned them, I planned outfits, I planned colour, 
um, a lot of the time, I don't know, like with grief, that you do go back to nature and colour and you, you notice, you know, small bits of colour. And, and so I really wanted to design, you know, these, these um, photographs with colour in mind. And um, I have actually totally forgot what the question was. Sorry. <laughs> you were answering it. Oh, am I? Fine. I guess it was more about really process. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, so I guess that's, yeah, that was kind of my experience of it, um, which I've never done before either. So, yeah. Sorry, your turn. Don't nod. No, I'll move on because <laughs> I've chatted. Right okay, just. fine. Yeah. Um, this is um, take, uh, taking pictures. Um, yeah, I would go back to film. I don't want to go back. I, 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 I spent about 12, 13 years shooting film, and I used to process at the back of my car. I did a lot of press work. Um, uh, so I used to process the film in the back of my car and then take the film to the, to the, to the, to the papers, and they would uh, then scan it on one of the Epson scanners, and then um, the pictures would appear to the next day. So I don't want to go back to film uh, ever, ever again. Um, uh, it's, it's really nice to, to, to actually work in the dark room. It's really nice to, to but I don't want to go back. <laughs> Digital is nice, it's good, it's clean, um, and it doesn't smell. Um, <laughs> uh, a picture like that, would, you, you'd have to walk about quite a lot, wouldn't you? To... Yeah, so what Anselm was saying was very similar. Uh, I don't really enjoy taking pictures. You get a lot of abuse. <laughs> the type of work that I do, um, you get a lot of abuse. Um, why are you taking pictures? What's what's important about taking pictures off the shoes in a mask? Why are you doing? Why have you shown that we haven't got enough money to buy nice shoes? Those sorts of questions will always come up and stuff like that. Um, so taking pictures, I'm uh, not really too excited by it. But when I started that, I was really young, I was still in my teens, and it was really nice to sort of do something locally and grow up and learn at the same time about my faith and how to communicate with people of different ages um, at different times of the day. The mosque is really weird in the sense that you've got older people at certain time, you get younger people at different times. So it's really interesting to be able to sort of move between generations and how you, how you, how you have to be very slow and patient with the older generation and then very quick with the younger because they're not going to hang around. Um, uh, so, I think I did a lot of growing up in those 10 years, um, and, and when I think back I mean, about memory, um, when we spoke at the Brady about this project, and I, I was, it was Brady, wasn't it? Um, and, uh, bad memory. Bad memory, bad memory. <laughs> um, what's really nice is that for me this time is never going to come back. Um, mm -hmm. Having the, just one camera, one lens, and walking around and having that freedom to just walk around all the time. And just take pictures. I don't think I've got the time to be able to do that again. Um, uh, and you just stop off and talk to people in the street and in shops, and uh, and that's the real enjoyment, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, that's the, getting to know people in your community uh, and getting their trust, and then going back later on and taking pictures of them. You know, um, I think it's really a nice, beautiful way to work. And as Seb sitting here. And she's she's uh, kind of commissioned me for a project that we're working on. But I've spent uh, it's just a two year project, and I haven't spent I haven't taken any pictures yet. I don't think not properly. I've spent the whole year talking to people. <laughs> it's been really quite nice. It's the way you should be, though. It is. Yeah, it is the way it should be. That's because you've got good people like Seb, you know, commissioning. Um, um, uh, yeah, I, I think if you can just slow down a bit um, mm. and get to know people a bit better. Uh, and understand for, for the type of work that I do anyway, um, which is documentary work, um, I think it's really important. Um, and it, it's, it's the nice thing about the work that I do is just getting to know people, I think. I wonder how much of the pushback that you get when you're shooting in the mosque is to do with the context that Muslims are living in, not, not wanting to be not, not anymore, not anymore. Last year, during Ramadan, I shot uh, East London Mosque. Mm. Um, I did the whole project again in 30 days, um, but in colour and digital, um, and, um, and didn't get any abuse, nothing, everyone was like, yeah, sure, take pictures of me, even, even the older generation were not posing for, um, for pictures, um, uh, but, but also the relationship people have with 
selfies and the camera. Yeah, it's, like, it's that all changed. There, no, no, it, yeah. wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't there. Um, um, so, yeah. Just one other thing that I did want to touch on um, about whilst making the work, some of the challenges um, was actually light, the, mm. the challenges of having lights in the space in the home. Um, it was pitch black, floor to, floor to ceiling. So to try and even get the camera to focus, to be able to find the focus point was pretty difficult. Um, and it's gonna hate me for saying this, but Gaurav over there, <laughs> who's actually photographing, um, he was there with a battery operated light because we had no electricity in the house. Um, and it was an LED panel and we literally had to make lights in that space. Um, but it was so pitch black that any form of light was being sucked in. And because it was the winter months, we were losing daylight and I wasn't supposed to be in there for more than 10 minutes at a time, only for emergency purposes. But we had been in there for four hours. And oh my God. God. <laughs> and our lungs were hurting and I was crying and I was sitting in my bed and it was like, don't get into your bed, you're gonna make yourself worse. But oh um, it, was, it was horrific, but we had to try and find light. and. We was trying to open windows, um, but the windows were covered in soot. Oh, so I think that was one of the biggest challenges of even being able to capture that archive, I guess. The fact that we, I had no access to light and I was trying to make light in such a dark space. Um, and I, I just, when you asked that question, I, I instantly remembered that particular challenge. Um, and then, you know, those battery operated LED panels that only last for 15 minutes and then it would die. Mm. And I remember going to one of the neighbours and saying, can we charge the battery, please? Um, yeah, so, um, but it was, a, it's, making that work wasn't a tra traditional way of making work, I guess. It was being forced into, uh, I was not forced into making the work, but it was a situation that I never planned for. And I think that was the challenge of making the work because I didn't really know what it was that I was photographing. I just knew I wanted to photograph. Um, and I think it, it was because it's the only thing that I understand in some ways. And so I just uh, channeled my energy to making some pictures about the experience. Tell, tell us about how it started. <laughs> Health and safety tip. Well, yeah, no, because that's the story. <laughs> okay, it's all about stories. Um, so, November is actually the, uh, apparently, sunlight is the strongest in November. So, mm. put your blinds down in November, everyone. <laughs> um, so, the sunlight travelled in through the living room window um, and it went through the fish tank, which then caused um, it to reflect and refract, is the scientific term and then caused us a, a heat spot to um, cause a fire to start on my son's toy boxes. And that is basically how the fire began. Um, and I knew that happened because I saw it happen around uh, August when I saw a car and the, to uh, the, the tire on the car was melted. And I was like, and the only reason I was able to relate to that is from Toy Story. <laughs> so Sid and the magnifying glass, again, mm. toy, Sid is a character from Toy Story, not my child. <laughs> Um, and uh, we move the uh, position of the fish tank, but obviously as the year goes by, the sun position changes, and uh, yeah, and that's how the fire started. Mm, no, the fish gosh. didn't survive before anyone asked. We <laughs> often get that. Did the fish survive? Uh, Andrew didn't make it, unfortunately. So many um, specific relationships in the whole project mm. so You were saying that. Yeah, you can't take a photograph without light. Mm. Mm. Really when um, and then you put them in light boxes. Yeah. Yes. When Ray had saw one of the images, it's like, why is there so much projection? Be quiet with you. It was hard enough to get light. Like, let's not talk about that now. <laughs> I'll kind of balance that digitally. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I mean, we do get lighter as as things have been moved out, as the walls have been wiped down. Uh, you are able to see sunlight, but I mean, again, that was at 11 o'clock in the day. If it, if it had got to three o'clock in the afternoon, as it starts to get darker, mm. um, it was just pitch black. I want to know about the creation. Did you 
So I, I mentioned earlier, and that's not to point out that you were late. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming, though. Um, I, I was saying earlier that um, I knew that I wanted to show this particular piece of work. It hadn't been shown, um, maybe because I've never quite concluded it. I didn't quite know how to show the work. Um, it was created as a journey over a 10-month period, going from darkness into light. Um, and so when David very kindly offered me the opportunity to show work here, I decided that it fit very well that I would be showing Lost in the Soot. Um, and then the, the running theme for me for that piece of work is memory. And I wanted to select artist's work that reflected memory, but memory in a collective and a personal way. So not just personal memory, but not also, but also memory that a wider, diverse community could relate to, um, and hence, you know, Anselm's project about. I mean, I don't mean specifically a black community in Beckham, but but it, because it is a community that you are yourself associated <coughs> with, it draws in a, a, a black community which might not necessarily have um, you gallery might not have necessarily attracted that community mm -hmm. um, unless there, so there is work there that people are able to relate to. Same with uh, Rayhan's work um, looking at Muslim communities. Uh, and I feel really chuffed that we mm -hmm. have drawn in such a, a wide audience. Um, and that, that's what it's about. I mean, last year I showed some work um, at the Whitechapel, and I had family members who felt that they couldn't walk in to a, a big gallery because they didn't know how to dress, or you know, are they able to walk into the space, or are they able to attend? And and really, because we, I think we take for granted the fact that we we view so much work, we go to galleries and openings and exhibitions, but we don't realise there is still a, a massive community of people who feel underrepresented or don't feel that they're able to engage with that work because maybe it doesn't speak to them um, and I that is the one thing that I wanted this show to I guess challenge and show that that's not necessarily true that you know you can there is a representation for everyone we can see it clearly here you know we've made this work we make I mean I, I've made this work for my son myself but you know these guys have made the work for either themselves or a, a wider community, and then the community that might not might nece not necessarily feel like they've been represented before. So, I th I, yeah, I think hopefully that answers your question. So, can I just come back? Yes. As well, I think the galleries. You're um, allowed. <laughs> um, I think galleries need to, if they want to engage with. I'm just going to speak from a Muslim perspective, actually. So, if they want to engage with Muslim communities, then they need to they need to understand those communities. Um, you've got, say, the White Chapel. No, no, no. <laughs> they're, they're a massive, massive art gallery in, in Tower Hamlets. Uh, and what do they actually do to engage with the community, mm. other than do a school project and stick it in the community room? Mm. Um, and and I think that they need to really understand their local communities if they really want to engage. Because they use them in the funding applications to say that we engage with local communities. Um, but then they do, very little, they do very little to actually really engage. Um, and if they just considered prayer times, for example, um, and thought, or Eid or Ramadan and not doing, not doing a show during Ramadan. And, <laughs> and, um, and, and, no, 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 no. So, so, so Seem was really good. So she, she organized it. I know, I know, I saw it, I saw it. Um, not yet, um, not yet. And, Sorry. Uh, uh, and consider those, consider the people that they're trying to engage and attract and ask to sort of come into the doors of the White Chapel. When I, when I did this at Rich Mix, Rich Mix is not really an art gallery. I, I got a whole lot of old people from the mosque to come down and young people and none of them had really been to an art gallery before. And one of the old men came up to me and said, right, so what do we do here? 
I was like, what do you mean? And he said, well, what do we do? We're here now. I said, well, just take a look at the pictures and grab a samosa and get some, get some, <laughs> you know, get a drink and walk around. He goes, is that what we're meant to do? I said, that's what we're doing. This is your project. Is you're in the pictures, you know, just walk around and see, have a chat. I said, go and talk to some <laughs> white people, you know, tell them what you do. And, um, and, uh, and they did, uh, which was good. Um, but they don't actually know what to do when they go to a gallery. Um, and so when, when, you, when you see the doors of the White Chapel open, um, and it, it, it's something you walk past the Moorgate East Station that you, don't, you never really go into, for a certain, for a certain section of the community, not, not everyone. Um, and I think, I think larger institutions need, need to do a lot more work, not just in, in, in um, commissioning new work, but actually just engaging with their communities mm -hmm. to sort of come and look. It doesn't have to be uh, an, an artist of, of colour or anything like that. It can be just what they're showing now, but engage with the communities in a meaningful way, mm. not just a tick box for exercise. I think exercise. community projects generally are very, it, it is a tick box, they're quite... Um, Something they have to do for funding. Purposes. They have to That's do it. for funding, but some of them can get quite a lot of funding for, but it's almost like not executed as well as it absolutely could be. Or it, it's a small bit on the side. It's not. It's not. Um, there's no longevity for it. Ch Chisholm Hill did a, a, a brilliant piece of work with um, an artist, and they engaged with the community really, really well. Really, really. I mean, they really engaged. They got out, met youth workers, and got young people in, and spoke to mums, mums groups, and stuff. And then they did the opening night after party in a pub <laughs> in Tower Hamlets, uh, and. Uh, yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't kind of make sense when you've done all this work and you've done you've, you've done really really well, and then you've spoilt it, mm. um, uh, and, and no no one turned up from the community. Obviously, it was a heathen, but no one locally from, from the Muslim community turned up. I want to get a few last questions in from the audience. I've got a question um, there. I was just speaking to my mother outside. How is how's it been like to um, have to see what you said about um, making light out of nothing and something like that? Um, have you guys have had any um, difficulty in trying to capture the message or trying to portray it? Or has, has it been like, I just shoot, then this is what I'm just stopping in the moment right for a second? Or has there been like any other difficulties you've had to overcome to get that message across? Yeah, shitloads. <laughs> <laughs> like, so many, you know, even now, it's like, yeah, loads. <laughs> I don't know, like, uh, especially for my project anyway, um, because I was creating I don't know, fucking like emotion over grief. Like you're like photographing the invisible. So, you know, there's there's other parts of the project. I, I ended up dressing up as my father, and I had this beard, which I bloody loved actually. <laughs> I did some like it really suited me, didn't it? Like, um, and did some self portraits with that. And those I've decided just because I'm only showing a selection went in here. Um, but yeah, just really experimenting. I still an unclear. It's not a complete finished body of work uh, so yeah like the journey I think is is really uh, intense confusing light bulb moments amazing blah, blah, blah. I think that goes back to the earlier question about the very different practices people mm. have as well and so that if you're setting out to make a series of work or a particular work that's a particular body of work which isn't what you might usually do then suddenly you have new yeah and it depends so that was definitely you know therapy whereas I'm working on a body of work now called um girlhood which is very much I'm investigating and looking at facts and figures and stuff like that so it's I guess it depends on you what you're shooting people want to put you in a box they want to know are you a photographer what kind of work do you do what do you make and actually I mean, even ask my husband, he'll be like, what is it that you do again? <laughs> and I'm, it's really hard to categorize what I do and to explain what's behind it. And I'm actually at the point now where I'm actually fine with that because I'm developing and researching and figuring out what it is that I'm interested in and finding different ways of expressing that. And sometimes it's going to be, you know, pressing flowers. Other times it's going to be heading non-Islamophobe Islamophobic talks, researching. Um, so yeah, I'm quite happy to, to. What do you call yourself? I say photographer and visual artist because people want to to know exactly what it is that you do. Um, so I do say that because I guess to an extent I am a performer too. Um, 
but yeah, it's, that, that's actually a challenge for me to explain. And even like in presenting this work, um, it's the penny only dropped when I started sharing some things on Instagram where lots of messages were coming through saying, oh my God, that's really interesting and amazing. But it's kind of, it's once you start telling the story behind it, it doesn't matter what the form is, mm, okay. that is what then starts to resonate. So the challenge is to stay out of the box, actually, because I think that that, in a way, um, keeps you evolving, hopefully. Oh, I like that, the challenge is stay out of the box. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of conscious that we're coming very close to the end of our time, and you, you, some of you may want an opportunity to quickly see the exhibition before the, we close. Tonight, and um, has anyone got any? Is there any last pressing questions that no, that people have felt that just need answering? Because your chance is now. Yes. <laughs> so you talked earlier about controlling your own history, and I think that seems to be quite a central part of kind of memory, the, the theme that's in the through. And it seemed to me controlling our own history is about representation. And when you create pieces of art and put them into a space to share with people, you leave that open to interpretation. So you lose, you let go of being controlled. And I just wondered how that feels as artists to work so much on what you're creating on your terms and then to share it into a world as an act of representation, but then to lose some of the control. Or do you feel that you're holding control Made a statement of what matters to you or what you capture. I don't know if any of you got a view on that. Well, for me, well, for all of us actually, this is only a selection of our work. So already, by showing, um, you were talking about sequencing earlier, by just showing a selection, you've already lost control of the, you know. And I think if you're showing work, I'm not in control of what anyone thinks of my work or what anyone takes away from my work. But as long as I feel comfortable with the work and I can talk about it, which I can now, I couldn't when I was making it because it was all a mess. But now I can articulate it and I can put it in context. And then whatever someone else takes, you know, because if you didn't know that, they look like really pretty, colourful, nice pictures of girls. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so, I, I don't know, I, I, I'm quite excited by people having completely whatever they you know they think of it. So normally when I go into an exhibition space like this, I wouldn't have had the privilege yeah. of hearing you talk about and sharing your work. So it's really interesting to now go and look at the work with that sort of set of thinking. Yeah. I think that's a great point to end on as well. So thank you very much to the artists for uh, for their, their presentation this evening and thank you to you all for coming. And it's been a it's been a wonderful discussion. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.